full nostalgia goggles on. I love this game. I'm taking a firm hardline stance that this is one of, if not the best movie tie-in games, and I wish we had more like it. King Kong was a 2005 film from Lord of the Rings director Peter Jackson, starring Jack Black, Naomi Watts, Jamie Bell, Evan Park, and Adrian Brody. The story involved an ambitious, down-on-his-luck director trying to get his film made. His character can be summarized as Eddie from Ed, Ed and Eddie was in the 1930s, and instead of trying to con kids in the cul-de-sac for jawbreakers, he's conning a bunch of rich executives into making his shitty movies. When no one believes his crackpot notions of a lost island of monsters, he tricks everyone involved into getting on a boat telling them they're going to Singapore. Did I mention that this movie is three hours long, and it's not until the hour and ten minute mark that Kong even appears? One of the biggest strengths of this game is how it trims a lot of the fat and fluff from the film and gets right to the good stuff. Sorry Pete, when I was seven and this movie first came out, I didn't give a single shit about Naomi Watts and Adrian Brody on the boat and everything leading before it. I just wanted to see Monkey. Granted, I did rewatch the movie for the first time since 2005 for this video, and the first hour and a half is not nearly as boring as I remembered it when I was a kid. And in fact, I enjoyed it quite a bit. But I still think that the movie could have been trimmed down a little because there are just some scenes that I'm like, why is this in the film? Unlike most of the time where movie tie-in games were shovelware crap for parents to buy their kids because, oh look, it's Space Chimps. They loved that movie. The game must be just as good. It even comes with a discount on movie concessions. Peter Jackson wanted this game to be a close brother or sister to the film, so Ubisoft worked closely with the film studio, having full access to their art department and even having people come out to the movie sets while it was being filmed in New Zealand. I first became aware of Michelle Ansel's work um, last Christmas, actually, because I had a wonderful time playing one of his earlier games, Beyond Good and Evil which was the most wonderful adventure game. It was imaginative, there were great characters. And I thought that Michelle has just a great storytelling skill in making you so involved in the game as a player that you actually become emotionally attached to the characters that you're playing with. Um, I was able to play Beyond Good and Evil endlessly um, from one end of the game to the other. I think it took me three or four days to get through it. Um, and I just had a great time. A and I thought, wow, if, if somebody this imaginative can take that story and actually get me so involved in it. This is the sort of person I'd love to work with on King Kong. You can really see and feel Jackson's love and respect he has for both the King Kong IP and the video game medium in this interview. I think this is one of the biggest strengths that the game has going for it, where it feels like an expansion of ideas from the movie and using monsters that didn't end up making the cut. Admittedly, some things are not nearly as crazy as their movie sequence counterparts due to what I would imagine would be very strict hardware limitations releasing the game on two console generations and handhelds. The game does its best to recreate some of these set pieces, but even then they do admittedly fall flat. <laughs> Because of this vision of being a sister piece to the film, they actually got the actors to voice themselves for the game, instead of the usual of using sound-alikes. Jack Black is especially great in this, hamming it up and just stealing the show. <laughs> He kind of gives me Ed Wood vibes in this, especially with how he just randomly stops and films random things on the island. He's like, yes, we'll throw this in the movie. When you stop and think about it, how the hell is his movie going to be any good? It's just an assortment of random things that he just stops and films and throws it together. I guess he really is like Ed Wood. Everyone is doing their part exceptionally well, except for Adrian Brody, which some of his lines read like they were delivered while he was half asleep. The soundscape to this game is phenomenal with tons of memorable sound effects that I could hear in my my head still all these years later before even booting the game up back for this video. Just listen to some of these. Bullets. 
Five magazines on backup. We gotta reload. Two magazines on backup. Oh, I'm dry. Like I said earlier, the game trims a lot of the fat of the movie and gets us to the good stuff right away. Our journey starts just as the boat reaches the island, but due to the weather and terrain, our boat is destroyed, our crewman is killed from a rock smashing his skull, and we are separated from the rest of the group. Like the actual filming of Carl Denham's movie, the story of this game takes a back seat, existing pretty much as a vehicle to have the player take a ride on this amusement park roller coaster of adventures through the island, trying to make their way out and one piece. Normally what I just said would be a harsh criticism of a game, but I think in this instance it's one of my favorite qualities. It's unabashedly gamey. It has a perfect blend of six generation attempts of immersive gameplay with things like no HUD, requiring you to constantly check how many magazines you have, using smaller insects and animals to distract larger creatures, allowing you to lure them into grass so you could set it on fire and kill them, and overall arcadey feel to gameplay with the scoring at the end of your play playthrough which unlocks behind the scenes stuff and filters. This game is a really good example of why I love the sixth generation so much. Games from this era were experimental with trying to be immersive and cinematic, but in ways that didn't get in the way of gameplay. Rarely did they take control away from you or slow your speed down and make you walk super slow to look and focus on a certain thing. They followed the Half-Life created design idea of, hey, we're gonna have a scene going on and we're gonna leave the player in control but we're gonna have these little tricks running in the background to make them actually focus on it, like lights or sound effects or characters calling out, or keeping them interacted with the events going on. It's very intentional with what it wants you to do and what it wants you to be looking at without being obnoxiously restrictive about it. Sure, you can say that this game is only four hours long, but it's an enjoyable four hours from start to finish. There isn't any stupid crap that gets in my way that I feel like is a waste of my fucking time. No pointless busy work on the side. No meandering side content. Basically, what I'm saying is Ubisoft games now fucking suck. I wish they would go back to making games like this. It's funny to look back at early parts of this game and how they scared the shit out of me as a kid. Being completely unarmed, walking through the tall grass, hearing velociraptors skulking in the distance, hiding in these small ruins trying to take refuge from velociraptors. But you're not 100% safe in these since they can partially fit their bodies into them and attack you. Trudging through the swamps as giant fish monsters swim just below the murky surface. Facing off against a T-Rex by yourself while Jack Black tries to open a door. Fighting off against a horde of velociraptors in these abandoned ruins or the music that plays while your health is low and the game slows down and has this nice filter over it, as you could hear the faint screams of other characters shouting your name in horror as they're overwhelmed and attacked by other monsters and need help, or they're just worried for your own well-being. or trying to carry a spear with fire on it so you can burn all these weeds. But the area you're going through has a bunch of waterfalls and water, so you have to be careful that you're not breaking the stick on enemies or letting the fire accidentally go out. Just saying these sentences made me realize how well this game did to keep the tension and the danger that everything around you is much more of a threat than you are to them. It did a great job of survival horror with disempowering the player, but not making them completely unable to fight back. You can still scavenge around and use things like broken dinosaur bones as makeshift spears. It sets up a lot of tension in these areas with enemies ambushing you and not knowing where they are, similar to ways that the original Resident Evils did. Like how you saw the liquor cross the window in Resident Evil 2, or how you saw the drain demo scuttle up the building in Resident Evil 3. You can just see the giant centipedes scuttling around in the ceiling or on the walls in your peripherals as you're going through areas. So many things that you just catch in the corner of your eyes as you're making your way through things that make you go, what was that? Uh, uh, what was that? Where did that go? The camera and FOV feel intentionally claustrophobic at times to sell this idea. The game also does a great job of capturing the scale of fighting a giant dinosaur as a dude with a Tommy gun. Sorry. 
Something that really helps sell the atmosphere of this game is its color palette. Each section has a very distinct color to it, like all the opening sections have a very harsh blue or green to them. It creates a really cold and unwelcoming feeling to these ruins as the rain pours down on top of you. It really feels like you're in a place that you shouldn't be. The game also just really holds up visually with tons of little detail and all of the texture work. It's hard to believe in some of these sections that the game is 15 years old. Obviously, there are things that don't hold up, like people's faces, for example. There are some textures that are pretty blurry and murky, but just look at dinosaurs and other monsters that you fight, and they look really good still. They could easily just make a very bare-bones HD remaster, and it would look amazing. Maybe if those machine-learning AI that upscale pre-rendered backgrounds became smart enough to just do regular texture work, we could just have a fan-made HD texture pack. One thing I realized while writing this section of the video is that while the game takes place in a jungle, and like I just mentioned has very specific color palettes for each section, some of which are pretty similar to things like the velociraptors and giant piranhas, the game always maintains visual clarity. It doesn't cause the same issue I have with modern high fidelity games, where everything blends together in the worst kind of ways, or I feel like I'm being overloaded on visual stimuli. Enemies both blend in and stand out enough that it feels fair and intentional, which is a testament to the impeccable art direction of this game. It's not like when I play the new Call of Duty and I struggle to see enemies on those really grassy hill maps. The only modern game I could think of that has done this well recently is Death Stranding. The other thing that really helps sell this game's atmosphere is the accompanying soundtrack. I'm no musical expert, so my vocabulary for explaining things is very limited, but you can just watch some of these clips and you'll understand how things like the booming drums really add to the tension. The sound mixing in this game is so aggressively loud that I have to think that this is intentional. Stay alert! Reload. Four magazines on backup. But playing as Adrian Brody's Jack with his assortment of weapons against creatures out of time isn't the only gameplay this game has to offer. At points throughout your adventure, your perspective swaps from Jack to Kong. The first few times, it's really cool because the level naturally flows right into each other, as Jack is helpless to save Anne from the bats and then Kong swings down to save her. Or when the gang is cornered by the T-Rexes on the rafts and they are slowly floating to their death and then Kong shows up to save the day. Though, it stops being like this after a while and just fades to black and suddenly you're playing Kong now. I noted earlier that some set pieces fall really flat due to not being able to capture the scale of the situation, like the Brontosaurus march with its inability to convey things like the impending danger of getting stomped on while being chased by velociraptors, or the speed and feedback of being in the middle of a stampede. Despite these limitations, the game perfectly captures the scale and weighty feel behind being being a giant monster. Everything around Kong's combat perfectly sets it up to be as satisfying as possible. The crunchy impact sounds and feedback of Kong going ape shit, the changing of the lighting when he enters fury mode, the slowdown when making contact with other monsters when in fury mode, the perspective and camera angles when fighting bosses, it's all fantastic. Though, I find that the Kong missions where you're fighting the natives and platforming are pretty lackluster, and even as a kid, I bum-rushed through them to get back to playing as Jack, or to get to the next T-Rex fight so I can do wrestling moves on them. Awesome, maybe, I don't know, got out of the way. Matt Hardy crashed and burned. Look at Randy Orton slithering. Oh, watch, like out, watch, out, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out! Here's the cover, hook of the line, and the legend killer picks up the victory. 
One level that always stood out as weird to me was after you make it through the swamps as Jack, the game transfers control to Kong chasing Anne to get her back after she escaped during the fight with the T-Rexes. The level ends with Kong getting her back and then Hayes shoots Kong from a mile away with a Tommy gun. Then after a loading screen, we are on the log from the movie that gets turned over and the crew gets thrown into the depths of the fissure. It feels like there should have been an entire level between these two that led the gang to being trapped by Kong on this log. Imagine a level where they're running through the jungle and Kong is chasing them, similar to how you were chased by the T-Rexes while you're on the rafts going down the whitewater rapids. The level could end with them getting to the log and then and being cornered while trying to cross it to get to the other side so Kong can't chase them. Instead, what we got is this really awkward cut from a level that's not even a minute long, and since the context is now different, they no longer fall off the log into the pit and fight a ton of insects. Instead, it is a transition into Jack going his own separate way to try to save Anne, while characters like Carl Denham are trying to go back to the boat because he's now defeated because his camera is destroyed, while Hayes and Jimmy will try to meet up with you down the river, which leaves you all alone again. This may sound weird in a video that claims this game to be a forgotten classic, but I would love to see a from the ground up full blown remake, something similar to the Destroy All Humans remake that just came out recently. Imagine the set pieces like the rapids on the raft while the two T-Rexes chase you, but not being held back by 6th and early 7th generation limitations. These moments can be as fast and as tense as my nostalgic memories of them are, because admittedly, as much as I do love this game, some of these set pieces do not hold up. The T-Rexes are slow and lumbering, so being chased by them feels really awkward. I'd hardly call these whitewater rapids, I've seen faster currents at Splish Splash. Imagine the scale of the final level with modern hardware and game development knowledge. The streets could be filled with people running away, and have the city feel like an actual lived-in place, rather than an empty box covered in powder with only a few cop cars and searchlights that you have to destroy, which spotlight effects caused by said searchlights occasionally break, leaving Kong looking like he just had an unfortunate experience in somebody's jar. The one cool thing though about this final level is that there's actually an alternative ending. If you last long enough on the Empire State Building, you could actually play as Jack in a plane and help Kong not die, to where then he could climb off the tower and you get a scene where he's back on the island now. But I ran into this hilarious bug in the original ending of the game, where Jack Black's face is just completely fucked up. It wasn't the airplanes. It was Beauty Killed the Beast. Despite its foibles and glaring issues, I absolutely think that this game is worth checking out. It's incredibly ambitious, and even when falling flat on its face, I can't help but find it irresistibly charming. The PS2 version of this game can be bought really cheap on eBay for $4 to $8, or you can just emulate it. The Xbox 360 version for some reason has gone up in price since I bought it back in December, having most going for about $20 to $30, or you could always buy it off the Xbox Live Store. I'm 100% serious when I say that if anything in this video interested you or sounds appealing to absolutely check this game out I think you will really enjoy it because games like this that invoke this type of feeling just really don't get made anymore and I wouldn't want this era of video games the one that I love the most to go forgotten if you've made it this far into the video I just want to say thanks for watching as always if you really liked the video and the channel, maybe consider becoming a patron on Patreon. All patrons get access to my videos a day early, and now I'm going to shout out my $5 and up patrons who really help support the channel. Bully, Tristan the White Wolf, Dusty the Zombie, FilthyFinger69, Clivermort, Fies, William Moore, Mr. Kill Jr., Tyler Scherzer, Some Panda, Poke Joke S, Joshua D. Larino, Chichomatrius, Ben Johnson, Sarah Chan, Oods of Nudes, Fish Kami, Joan Eisen, Alejandro Benitez, Star Fox, Flarboo, and Mitchell. Thanks so much, guys.
Follow me on Twitter for updates for what videos are coming next, and if you're a card game player of any kind, I have a TCG Player affiliate link. Any purchases made on TCG Player using my link will give me a small kickback, so it's just another way to help support the channel. As for what's next, this Sunday will be the Hitman Absolution Retrospective. Like I said earlier, patrons get access to this video a day early, and tune in next Wednesday for the next Forgotten Classic, this time covering Metal Arms Glitch in the System. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.